Cells depend a lot on diffusion and osmosis, so we're going to review what these words are talking about. So remember that molecules are always moving as long as they're at a temperature above zero Kelvin, which they are in living systems. Uh, molecules are always moving, and because of that movement, they tend to spread out from areas where they're more highly concentrated to where they're less highly concentrated. And that's a general description for diffusion. Think of a bottle of perfume. If you open a bottle of perfume, then um, just give it a few minutes, eventually, even on the other side of the room, eventually you're gonna be able to smell that perfume. And that's because the molecules are diffusing from where they were more highly concentrated in the bottle of perfume to where they are less highly concentrated. They diffuse out into the air and they tend to spread out. So that's diffusion. Diffusion is something that takes place if there's no physical barrier separating two areas, but it can also take place um, even through a membrane. If that membrane is selectively permeable, if it lets some things through, uh, then some substances will be able to diffuse even across a membrane. So the plasma membrane is something that allows, again, diffusion of some things and not others. A lot of times when we talk about diffusion, we are interested in in the solute, the thing that is dissolved inside of something else. So remember this word solution. When we talk about a solution, a solution consists of a solvent and a solute. A little definition up here. Okay, so usually in living things, the solvent is water and the solute would be some sort of molecule that's dissolved in the water. It could be salt, it could be sugar, it could be whatever we're interested in considering. All right, so if we're considering diffusion of solute molecules, what are some things that influence the rates of diffusion? It turns out there are a few key things that really come into play in living systems. So definitely the concentration difference between one area and another, or on one side of a membrane and another side of a membrane. Okay, so if we look at um, this picture up here, this little schematic, the black dots are representing a solute that's dissolved in water. And over here it's more highly concentrated, here it's less highly concentrated. So which direction is diffusion going to take it? It's going to take those molecules to the right, if at all possible, if that molecule is able to cross this barrier. Okay, so net diffusion would be to the right. And if we make this side even more concentrated, then that rate of diffusion is just going to increase. It'll go even quicker to the right. Permeability of the membrane certainly influences the rate of diffusion as well. So imagine if you poke more holes in this membrane, um, then that would allow diffusion to happen more quickly. Temperature. Temperature is something that influences how quickly molecules are moving. And the more quickly they move, the more frequently they'll bump into each other and tend to, um, tend to spread apart from each other. So temperature, generally higher temperatures means faster rates of diffusion. The surface area of the membrane, this becomes very relevant when we talk about microvilli, so like in the digestive tract. Um, if we just increase the surface area of the membrane, okay, that allows more spaces over which diffusion can take place. So that's another thing that's generally, generally correlated with rates of diffusion. Something that's very relevant in the human body is this note down here. So in general, uh, what happens is our cells are dependent on the blood, the blood plasma, to carry nutrients to them. Uh, but remember, the cells aren't in direct contact with the blood plasma. So instead, what has to happen is diffusion. Molecules from the blood plasma diffuse out across the, ex uh, the extracellular spaces, and they diffuse over to wherever the cells are at. That's only an effective means of transport if the blood uh, plasma is within about 100 micrometers of the cell that we're talking about. And so this really explains a lot about why we have blood capillaries that go out to all the different places of the body. There is literally a capillary within 100 micrometers of every living cell. And that's just to, to be able to provide um, an adequate supply of nutrients and carry wastes away from the cells um, using diffusion as the transport mechanism. So if distance is greater than 100 microns, diffusion just takes too long to, to be productive. A special subtype of diffusion is osmo osmosis. Osmosis is referring to the diffusion of water molecules. And so this is kind of interesting because it puts our puts our emphasis on the solvent molecule. Okay, so osmosis is really talking about diffusion of the solvent in many cases. 
Osmosis is something that allows a lot of movement across plasma membranes, and that's because plasma membranes have special protein channels. They're called aquaporin channels. Uh, water would not be able to just uh, cross the plasma membrane directly. It can't squeeze by the phospholipids, but there are protein channels in cell membranes that allow water to move. So osmosis is something that happens in and out of cells. A couple of requirements in order for osmosis to take place. Okay, there has to be something to drive the osmosis to happen. So there has to be some sort of a concentration difference on the two sides of the plasma membrane. Water always likes to flow towards towards the dissolved substances. So if there's a lot of salt over here, um, then the water is going to tend to move in that direction. If we zoom in on that membrane, the plasma membrane, remember it's selectively permeable. It lets some things through and not others. In this schematic, it's allowing water through, just like plasma membranes do, but not necessarily other big molecules that are dissolved in the water. So the solute is not able to cross. If it were able to, if these were able to cross, then which direction would they go? They tend to go to the left. That's what diffusion would cause them to do. Uh, but they're not able to move. So instead, what happens is the water moves, the water moves to the right in order to try and equalize the concentrations on these two sides of the membrane. So that's osmosis. The water is the thing that is moving. The fact that water can cross this membrane, even, even when solutes cannot, this is something that's extremely important. This means that the extracellular matrix of the cells needs to be maintained at very precise conditions. Otherwise, osmosis might start to cause problems for the cells. We'll be seeing a little bit more of that in just a moment. Let's talk about ways to measure solute concentrations, right? The solute concentration is what is driving osmosis in this case. Um, so it's useful to review a couple of things here. I'm sure you've heard about molarity and molality before when you've taken chemistry. So just by way of a reminder, what is a mole? A mole is a unit of weight. It's the weight of this many molecules or atoms or whatever we're talking about. So it's the weight of um, this number of things. Okay, so when we talk about molarity, if we say we have a one molar solution, just like this, one molar solution, what that really means is that it contains one mole of solute dissolved in however much water is needed to make a liter of solution. So what this number is telling us is some information about how much solute is present. Okay, so how much of the solute that's dissolved in water. Okay, molality, on the other hand, this is a little bit different. What molality does is it gives us the specific ratio, how much solute is present and how much water is present too. So if we talk about a one molal solution, this number indicates a couple of things. It's saying we have one mole of solute, but it's also telling us that we're talking about um, that solute being dissolved in one kilogram of water. So we know information about both the solute and the solvent, how much of both are present. So that's kind of nice. It's nice to have that information about how much water are we dealing with too. Uh, we've just been saying that a lot of times for cells, it's the water that's the thing that, that can move and cross membranes. So molality, this is going to be a little bit more useful of a measurement for us than molarity. We're gonna be spending more time talking about this than this um, in physiology. That leads us to this word, osmolality. Osmolality considers essentially all of the different solutes that might be present. So we might have more than one thing, right, dissolved in water. You could have salt and you could have sugar dissolved in water. And osmolality is looking at sort of the total amount of dissolved things in a set amount of water. So let's look at a couple of examples here. And we're gonna be referring to this picture over here on the slide. Let's start looking at the, at the inside here. This is kind of like considering what's inside of a cell. Let's consider a 2 molal solution. Okay, so 2 molal glucose solution. We can see that in here. The total osmolality is 2 because there's nothing else other than the glucose. All right, now let's consider outside of the cell over here in the surroundings in the beaker. 
Okay, this solution out here in the surroundings, it has a one molal glucose solution and it also has a one molal fructose solution. So if we consider both of those solutes together uh, and just think about what's the total number of solute molecules present, essentially what we're dealing with is a combination of the two, right? In total, we have a two osmolal solution. The osmolality is two. And so what that means is that there's no real driving force for osmosis to happen in either direction. Osmosis would take place equally in as it would out because the osmolalities in those two different locations match. So osmolality, this is an important concept. This is what's going to help us make predictions about which direction water is going to go from one solution to another. Let's look at another example, getting a little bit more complex here. If we're dealing with something like a salt, something that dissolves in water and comes apart into multiple pieces, then things get a little bit more complicated. So let's just consider if we take some salt and mix it into water, what's gonna happen, right? The sodium ion is going to be pulled apart from the chloride ion, and those are going to exist as two separate particles in the water. Okay, so if we start out, if we measure one mole of, of sodium chloride, and if we mix that into, um, into water, what's going to happen is it will actually turn into a two uh, a two molal solution. The osmolality will be two. How can osmolality be measured, right? Sometimes we don't um, intentionally mix up solutions, rather sometimes we just have a solution and we want to figure out what is its osmolality. This is something that's actually pretty easy to measure. If you measure the freezing point of a solution, that will give you an indication of how much stuff is dissolved in the water. It turns out the more things you dissolve in water, the lower the freezing point will become. And that kind of makes sense. If you think about what happens when water freezes, remember those hydrogen bonds have to stabilize into a crystalline structure. And if you add a bunch of other molecules in there too, essentially they're just gonna get in the way of those hydrogen bonds forming. So the more things we have dissolved in water, the lower the temperature will have to be in order for the water to freeze. So freezing point depression is something that is correlated with osmolality in solutions. The freezing point lowers with more particles present in solution.